Good day, grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In this lesson today, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be learning about electrodynamics. Now, yesterday we started this lesson and we started on electrodynamics and I started going through what you should know from grade 11 and then we ended and ended up having to end the lesson um, basically because we ran out of time and also because the internet connection for some reason was pretty slow so today we're going to yeah I think it died on us here yeah so what we're going to do is we're going to start again <laughs> okay to remind you of where we at and then we're going to look at Faraday's law etc etc so let's have a look at it so when we're talking about conductors in the magnetic field we're talking about a wire that is moving um, okay so what you can do is two things okay you can either take a piece of wire and move it in a magnetic field but usually an easier thing to do is take a magnet and move it near a conductor okay so let me just show you what i'm talking about um so we've got here an animation and what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we've got a coil of wire okay and we'll talk about exactly what's going on in a minute what we're going to do is we're going to take a magnet and we're going to move it through the coil of wire and what happens is that as a magnet moves through the coil of wire electricity is produced in those wire it causes the electrons to move okay and we're going to talk about exactly how this works and everything in a second but what you should have learned already is that when a conductor is moved in a magnetic field or when a magnet is moved near a conductor a current flows in the conductor and it doesn't matter whether i'm moving the magnet and notice i can move it all around i don't have to go through the coil okay it just gives you a better response if i go through the coil if i move the magnet with respect to the coil or if i had a situation where the coil could be moved with respect to the magnet it's the same thing okay it's going to give you exactly the same response that basically you've got a coil I and mean, you've got a magnetic field and a conductor that are interacting with each other the amount of current that you get depends on a couple of things. First of all, speed at which the conductor experiences a changing magnetic field. Okay, so if we go back to this animation, what we have is a couple of coils of wire and we've got, now unfortunately this is voltage and not current, but you'll get the gist, okay? So, and unfortunately with this animation, I can't change this to an ammeter. So, you'll get the gist, okay? So basically, if I move this slowly, do you see that the light bulb doesn't light up very quickly, very much? I'm moving it very slowly, right? You can see it's very, very little bit of light, okay? Happening, okay? But if I move it fast, my light bulb is changing, is getting very bright, okay? And if I do it very fast, it should get very bright, okay? Right, so you can see that the faster I go through the wire, the speed at which the conductor experiences a change in magnetic field increases the amount of current. Okay, so the greater the speed, the greater the speed, the greater the current. Okay, do you understand that? So the faster we change that magnetic field, the faster we are going to, or the change the rate at which we are, the conductor is experiencing a changing magnetic field, the greater the current. And there's something very important you need to see here. Watch what happens if I just go once through. Jush. Do you notice that the current stops? The minute this stops moving, there is no more current. Okay, so the only time you get current is when it's experiencing a change in the magnetic field. So let's add some field lines. So these are the magnetic field lines around the magnet. You will notice they go from north to south as you would assume anyway through any magnet, right? But now look what happens. As I'm going through here, my conductor is being cut. The magnetic field lines are being cut as we go through the conductor, right? So the faster I go, my magnetic field lines are cut through this, okay? The, f the bigger the voltage, okay? But if I stop, do you see there's no change in magnetic field lines with respect to the conductor? And because of that, 
okay, you end up with there being no current. But now look what happens if I swap them. Watch. Do you see that just by swapping, I'm actually causing there to be a current flowing? Okay, well, obviously, at the moment, this is a um, animation or simulation. So they're just swapping it. And by swapping the direction of the magnetic field lines, we're effectively uh, causing there to be a current. Now, obviously, it's a bit cumbersome for us to go and swap them like this. But if you had a situation where you could swap the magnets by making it flick, you would actually cause the, in other words, if I could make this flick forward and over every time and I could keep going, do you see there'd be a change in the magnetic field lines and then there'd be a current flowing? Um, we're going to talk about the direction of the voltage in a bit, okay? Now, what else? The number of coils that make up the conductor. Okay, so let's have a look at that. Yeah, we've got the option. To, I'm going to take the field lines away. Okay, yeah, we've got the option to either go through two coils or to go through one, two, three, four coils. Okay, so if we go through two coils, okay, and let's do it fairly slowly just so that you can see the practice. Okay, now let's go through four coils. Look at the brightness of that light bulb. Okay, do you see the number of coils? affects the current that's flowing through, the amount of current that's flowing through. Let's try again. Okay, remember, just for the second, just remember that P is equal to um, VI, but VI is equal to R. Therefore, we can say that I, I mean V, is equal to um, hang on a minute, let me get this right. R is equal to V over I, sorry. Um, so, so therefore, IR is equal to V. Therefore, if we want, yeah, so therefore P is equal to I squared R. Okay, I squared R. So what I'm saying is, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because power is telling you about brightness of the light bulb. The brighter the light bulb, the more power there is in the circuit. So if we have a look at this, and with this light bulb, so let's go again, this light bulb's got a constant resistance, right? So therefore, if we were looking at my equation, the brightness of this light bulb is dependent on the resistance stays the same, is dependent on the current, okay? The brightness, which is represented by the the brightness is a relation to the power. The more power that's flowing through the light bulb, the brighter the light bulb's gonna be, okay? So P is equal to I squared R. So obviously the only thing that's affecting this relationship now is the I. So the current, remember, what did we just say, sorry? We said that the number of coils affect the amount of current. Okay, so now, yeah, we're gonna go. I'm gonna try and go through at exactly the same pace for each of these. So this has only got two coils. And I go through and look how bright it is, okay? You can notice that it's got like a two circle, it goes to about over here. Now let's go through the four. And do you see how much brighter it is? I'm still going through the same pace, but it actually hits the, the brightness indicator goes so bright that it actually goes past this voltmeter reading. Do you see it? There it is, okay? So what are we showing you? We're showing you that with this animation, that the greater the number of coils, the number of coils, the greater the current, okay? And the voltage, obviously. Okay, right. Finding the position of the plane of the conductor with respect to the magnetic field. Okay, so I can't really show you that with this animation, but what we're saying is that if this magnet wasn't directly in line, let's say it was at an angle of, um, hang on a minute, let me just see if I can't get a pen that I can write over this with you. Um, let's use Epic Pen. And we wait. Sorry, it's a little bit slow. There we go. Um, it's coming up now, soon, soon, soon. Okay, right. So let's just move it over. Epic. Okay, let's not. Come on. Okay, I don't know why it won't move over. 
Okay, so if I'm now in this window here with the Epic Pen, and what I wanted to show you was, <laughs> I bet you now it's going to be, yeah, let's go that dot. Okay, if this magnet was at a funny angle, like it was an angle like this, and it tried to cross this, then what would happen is you wouldn't have as bright a re result happening as this. And the reason would be, because if you think about the field lines, if you're going across like this, look at your field lines, you're getting the, they are 90 degrees to the coil. So you're getting the most amount of field lines being crossed, okay? Whereas if we go back to this, the field lines would be like this. Okay, I know it looks a bit like a bean now, but anyway, the field lines would be like this. So, assuming like that. So, they won't be at 90 degrees to the coil. As they come through here, they won't be at 90 degrees. And if that's the case, then you'll end up not getting the maximum amount of current through. So, the way you get the maximum of current is that the magnet and the coils have to be at, well, the magnetic field lines and the coils have to be at 90 degrees to each other. Okay, so let me go back to here. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the silly thing, I wonder if there's a way to raise all the trash. Trash, there we go. And now let's get rid of it. And okay, let's just move it over there. There we go. Okay, so now it's out the way. So therefore, and now I can just... Uh, <laughs> okay, so therefore we can say the position of the plane of the conductor with respect to the magnetic field. So what we can say is that the conductor, the conductor has to be perpendicular to the magnetic field to get a, to get a maximum current. Now, you might think, well, this is all very well, but we're just talking about magnets moving in within a field, a field, I mean, current conductors moving in within a magnetic field or vice versa. And why is this important? Because it is these three things that they will ask you over and over again, if they say to you with respect to generators and motors, which is what we're going to talk about in the next couple of later lessons in electrodynamics. These are the three things. If they say to you, how can you increase the output of a motor or generator? You are going to say these things. You're going to say the speed at which the conductor experiences a change in magnetic field. Okay, you're going to talk about the number of coils and you're going to talk about the position of the plane of the conductor with respect to the magnetic field. These three things come up in grade 12 a lot, whether you're speaking, 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 whether you're speaking about generators or motors. Okay, right. So now let's talk about Faraday's law. Faraday's law basically is what we've been talking about. He relates the induced EMF, in other words, the voltage, Okay, which we're going to talk about now again, to the rate of change in magnetic flux. Okay, so magnetic flux, okay, you don't need to know the formula for the magnetic flux, it's no longer in the curriculum, but it basically is a product of the magnetic field strength and the cross sectional area of the field lines pass through. Okay, so it's a very complicated way to say that magnetic flux is a measure of how quickly. The fill is a measure of the number of coils that cross the um, magnetic field lines. Okay, so Faraday's law basically relates the, if you go back to it, it relates the amount of EMF to the rate at which these field lines are crossed. Okay, that's effectively what it's saying. Oh, wrong one. Sorry, this one. So what we're saying is that Faraday's law says that the greater the rate at which we cross, the, cross these field lines, the greater the voltage. That's all that Faraday said. Okay, related the amount of EMF, and EMF is voltage, that you get out of a generator, okay, and with respect to the, how fast we go through. Okay, so... If we go through slowly, you will notice that the voltage doesn't get very big, okay? Whereas, if we go through very fast, then the voltage is much bigger, okay? If I go through lots fast, and if I take the full direction through. Now, the final thing I want you to notice is that 
the voltage changes direction. And the reason because of that is actually to do with Lenz's law. And I'm going to teach you more about Lenz's law in future lessons, but let me just tell you basically what it says, which is basically that the current, this thing acts as a magnet. When, when you get this electricity flowing through it, the current acts as a magnet, okay? And the way it works is that, I mean, the current the current in the coil makes it act like a magnet. And what it happens is, and it's quite interesting, is that the electrons flow, this, this is gonna act like a magnet and it's gonna do different things. So as this is coming towards it, okay, what's gonna happen is that this coil is gonna act like a magnet, but it's gonna act like a magnet in a way as to prevent this dude from coming in. Okay, so as this is a North Pole, right? So the only way this can prevent this North Pole from entering is if this acts um, like a North Pole. So this is going to act like a North Pole and this is going to act like a South Pole. So as I'm bringing this in, it's going to act like a North Pole and it's going to cause the electrons to flow one way, right? Then as I go through, effectively, actually, no, you will see there's no current flowing actually as we go through, right? But now, what happens is at this point, you'll notice it swaps. And the reason it swaps is because what actually happens is amazing, is that now it swaps direction because now this end of the, this end, of the coil is going to act in a way as to prevent this from leaving. So the only way it can prevent it from leaving is now the south end of the magnet is trying to leave. So this goes to north and this goes to south, okay? So you'll notice that as it comes through, it goes to the other direction, okay? Then if I try and go watch now what happens, if I push back, look, it goes in the opposite direction again. Pull, push, okay, pull, push. Why? Because if I'm pushing in, what's going to happen? This is going to act like a south pole. So to act like a south pole and it's going to try and prevent it from going in. There you go, one direction. Okay, now we'd think that this would be north, right? But it's going to go through south, south, south. But now it's trying to prevent it from leaving. So therefore this is going to be north still. But yeah, watch, watch, it's going to change direction again. There we go, it's changed direction. Why? Because it wants to stop this from leaving, so therefore this has swapped direction, and now, and now this dude is the south end. So there, there you go. So that's Lenz's Law, and I will talk to you a little bit more about it. But you'll notice that the voltage changes direction. So what we have is alternating current, okay? It changes direction the whole time because this thing here is trying to prevent the magnet either from coming in or once it's in from leaving. Okay, so and there's a rule for that and it's called the right hand rule where basically what happens is that if you we can work from that we can work out the direction of the current in this coil because your thumb will point to the north pole and your fingers curl the, the right hand curl around the coil in the direction of the electron so for, say for example i'm going to try and draw but i already suck a drawing but i'm going to try okay um and let me just first uh, erase everything and let's move this over so say, for example, we're coming along in this direction. So what is going to happen is obviously this is going to try and prevent it. So then what's going to happen is this is going to be the North Pole and this is going to be the South Pole, right? So if we had to use our right hand to do this, what's going to happen is my thumb has to point over here and then my fingers, I have to go curl around. So what happens is my fingers, <laughs> a really bad drawing will curl around so the current will be flowing this way okay the current is flowing this way around the coil okay because my thumb is pointing to the north pole so you can see that the current at the moment is going in this direction so it's coming towards it and up here and through here and through here and back through this way okay but as soon as I get this through, 
then this changes to a south, and then the current changes direction, because now my thumb would be facing that way. Okay, so we can use the right-hand rule to determine the direction of the current in the coil, but that's more great. 11 work than grade 12 work. Grade 12 work is more understanding this concept, so we can use it in motors and generators. Okay, so now that was Faraday's law. Now let's talk about a generator. Okay, so first of all, let's go back here. So what is a generator? A generator is something, I need to get out of here, is something that basically is a device that converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. So when we talk about generators, we're talking about that we need to put in mechanical energy. So in the olden days, they used to have slaves that would um, ride bicycles. No, they wouldn't. They would have to turn a crankshaft. Um, so if you've ever seen those old motor cars where they had this like little crankshaft that they had to turn in the front of the car to get it to go, that is a generator. Okay, so if you have a look here, um, we can look at this. Um, this is an animation by Edgy Wright, but it's actually um, a free a free thing that you can use on the internet if you're not selling your wares. So let's watch it. Okay, so what you've got here, and I need to explain this to you. So I wonder if I can pause. Let's pause. Okay, is we're looking at the components of a generator. Okay, so over here we have got a south pole of a magnet, and over here we've got a north pole of a magnet. Now in the previous thing over here, we moved the magnet. Okay, we used the magnet and the coil remained stationary. Okay, and that is great for these purposes of explaining this. But in the big generators, the magnets are huge. They are huge, 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 huge. So it's actually easier to turn the coil than it is to turn, move the magnets. Okay, so hang on a minute. Oh, I did it again watch this again and let's just pause it okay so it's easier for you for us to move the coil than it is to move the magnet okay so that's why we've got these big magnets and then we have a coil in the middle which they call the armature and I'll explain why in a minute also note that the, this is curved and the reason for this is remember we said that it is better that this magnet is at 90 degrees to the or in the same plane as the coil because then we have a nice beautiful 90 degree angle between the magnetic field and the the wire okay and that's exactly what's happening here we're going to have watch i'll show you now we're going to have an armature which is a coil but it's going to spin Okay, so as it spins, if the more the, the curve, the more the reason this is curved is because then this will be at 90 degrees to the surface the whole way around. And if it's 90 degrees to the surface all the way around, then we have a perfect alignment of the electric field and magnetic field being at 90 degrees to each other. Okay, so we'll we'll show you as it goes. Okay, right. So now we also have a current collecting arrangement. So what we've got, and I'll show you now, we've got slip rings, and I'll explain them now. We've got brushes, and we've got a voltmeter. Okay, so we're going to go through every one of these in a second, but this is for an AC generator. So in other words, this is something that generates electricity um, that we could use in the house. Okay, so we could connect this to our TVs or our fridges and it would run those things because everything in our house um, that doesn't require batteries is, an, is running an alternating current. Okay, so in other words, um, everything you plug into the wall is running on alternating current. Um, except for your laptops. If you think of it, if, if there is a box block, like a transformer that is connecting your, your plug through a block into your laptop, um, then it is running on DC. So another way you can think of it is this. If your item can use batteries, then it's using DC current, okay, direct current. 
If I ever, it cannot use batteries, then it's using alternating current. So your fridges, your stoves, your irons, your kettles, um, all your big appliances are using alternating current. Your hair dryers, oh, excuse me. Sorry, I got hay fever and it makes me do yawny things. Okay, your hair dryers, your fans, your air conditioners, your um, geezer, all use alternating current. Um, your TV sets, your, okay, that's it. Your laptops have a battery. So therefore, they're actually, even though they plug into the wall, the, the plug actually provides AC current, alternating current, which is then converted into direct current, which is what your laptop uses, okay? So anything that uses a battery, actually uses direct current okay but we still need alternating current it's very important it's very easy to convert alternating current into direct current so don't worry about that too much okay so let's now look at what these different components are so first of all let's talk about the armature okay wait i need to pause this thing again so the armature is a soft iron core Oh, where is it? It's a soft iron core on which a coil having a large number of turns of insulated copper wire is wound. Okay, so basically it is a big version of this. Okay, what they found was that if you take your coil and you wrap it around a soft iron core, then actually what happens is you get more current flowing through it. Because why? Because a soft iron core is easily magnetized. So effectively what you're doing is preventing a dead area, okay? So an armature is just really a soft iron core and then they wrap tons of turns of copper wire around it so that it can be turned. So this time, instead of us spinning, like I said, instead of us spinning the magnet, magnets, we're spinning the coil. Okay, let's continue. Let's continue. So that is the armature and you can see it's spinning. And also, oh, I did it again. I did it again. It's so frustrating. Um, what I want you to notice is check the voltmeter. As it spins the voltmeter in exactly the same process as last time, it is giving you alternating current every time, okay? And we'll talk about the direction of the current as we do that next lesson. Right, now, the next thing we're talking about is the magnetic poles. The magnetic poles are concave and cylindrical. The concave poles produce a radial magnetic field. In other words, it doesn't matter if this is now slightly at an angle because there will still be a magnetic field that is at 90 degrees to that, okay, because of this angle. So see if I can stop it a little bit more. Um, okay, so you can see that at the moment you've got beautiful magnetic fields that go straight across, okay. So, okay. Now, the slip rings. Slip rings are interesting. The ends of the armature are connected to two slip rings and they are very important. What happens is that what hap if you look at this carefully, you can see that this slip ring is attached to a branch which is attached to the one end of the voltmeter. And if you can see on the other side, this slip ring would also be attached to a branch which would be connected to this side of the voltmeter. Now, the slip rings rotate along with the coil. So one slip ring would be attached to the one side of the coil and the other slip ring would be attached to the other side of the coil, okay? They are made from metal and they're insulated from each other. So the reason you need the slip rings for the brushes is imagine if at the end of this armature you just had a piece of wire that was connected to this, but this thing's spinning, right? So as it's spinning, the wires would be spinning around and round and round and what would happen is that the slip rings, I mean, that the wires would get all mixed up and you'd only be able to go around a couple of times before you had a huge knot. What actually happens now is that the slip ring is attached to this side and it allows for there to be electrical contact via the brush to this one side of the voltmeter. And this slip ring allows the other side of the coil to be connected to this side of the voltmeter, okay? So the slip rings basically allow for the continuous flow of electricity, okay?
Then, the next thing we're going to talk about are the brushes. Now, the brushes are made of carbon. The reason they're made of carbon is because it's soft. And when I say soft, I mean it doesn't have any friction, or well, very little friction. You need to think of like graphite, okay, not diamond carbon. So, what happens is the slip rings, these slip rings, actually rotate within side. Where's my arrow? Okay, there it is. These slip rings rotate within the one side of the brush, okay? These brushes are incredibly smooth, okay? So the one end of the brush is always in contact with the rotating slip ring, and the other end is connected to the external circuit, okay? And it says, yeah, the brushes are connected to a galvanometer. And you need to think about what the word galvanometer means. Galvanometer, okay, if you're looking, um, if you're in a fairly modern lab, you might have a multimeter, digital multimeter, which means that if you click it to a certain setting, it'll read an ammeter, it'll read the amps, and if you click it to another setting, it'll read the volts. And that's what a galvanometer is. A galvanometer is basically a multimeter. There's something that has the facility to either read amps, um, the, amp, the, the current, or to read the volts. Okay, so that's all a galvanometer is. So this brush over, where's it gone again? Where's it gone? Where's it gone? Oh dear. Oh dear, it seems to freeze and then you can't actually get back to where you were. It's very frustrating. Okay, so we've got the brushes. Okay, so this brush connects this end and the brush on that side connects that end over there. Okay, right. Now, let's talk about the next thing, which is... Okay, wait. Um, hang on a minute. Okay. Right, so now we're going to talk about how it works. Okay, so you can see that it's spinning and as it's spinning, because there's actually, I don't know if you can actually see, but this thing here has got a little handle. So actual fact, there's somebody here cranking this thing, making it go around. Okay, there you go. There's the handle. So there's actually somebody cranking it. Okay, now what is happening is you can see that there's a magnetic field and what is happening is that because the wire is moving inside the magnetic field, there is a change in magnetic flux. And the change in magnetic flux causes there to be an EMF. Okay, in other words, it causes there to be voltage. Okay, so as it goes round, it is crossing the magnetic field lines, which effectively causes there to be a change in the magnetic flux, which means that we end up having some volts happening. Okay, do you understand that? So what you need to understand is that there's a relationship, okay, between certain things, and we're going to talk about that now. Okay, so the first thing in this graph is a time in terms of period of revolution t, okay? We'll talk about what that means. Remember that every time it goes round is a revolution, okay? We're going to look at the angle between the normal to the coil and the direction of the magnetic field, the position of the coils respect to the magnetic field, okay? The magnetic flux and the induced EMF. So at the moment, okay, so let's go through this, okay? So, there we go. So, at the moment, we started at this point here, okay? Now we're going to go around, okay? So, if we go around, okay, yeah. Do you see that we've gone from, we've now gone a quarter of a revolution, okay? Notice that the magnetic flux is zero. The maximum, we have a maximum induced EMF. Okay, wait. Okay, stop. Okay, let's go back a little bit. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we've got zero induced EMF. Okay, nothing. 
Nothing has been induced, okay? The angle between the normal to the coil and the direction of the magnetic field is zero. In other words, the magnetic field is going straight across, and if we had to draw a 90 degree angle to the coil, it would also be going straight across. So therefore, there's no crossing in the magnetic lines. The magnetic lines and the electric field lines around here should actually be at 90 degrees to each other for us to have a max maximum amount of electricity being uh, produced okay so at the moment there is nothing okay now uh -huh. now we get to this point here okay wait let's just go back a little bit okay yeah um it's doing it to me again there we go so at the top okay so if we go back I just want to go back to OK and then go forward. There we go. At this point here, as we get down to the flat bit, OK, when we get to this flat bit, this is at 90 degrees. But what is happening is the lines, yeah, we've, um, no, we want this. The lines, there's magnetic field lines across. OK, these are the magnetic field lines and they are 90 degrees. But the electric field lines that are being, I mean, the electric field that has been caused around this wire is now at 90 degrees. So do you see that they're interfering with each other? They're at 90 degrees with each other. So therefore, the angle between the normal to the coil and the direction of the magnetic field is 90 degrees. So therefore, you get maximum interference. Okay, so you get induced um, maximum value for your induced of, of voltage. So we're looking at, uh, let's check the color there. Um, we're looking at that point there is when this is parallel, is perpendicular to the magnet, right? And that is why we have this coil because curved, because then this, hopefully, this mag, this coil will be perpendicular to the magnet surface much, much more at a greater period of time. Okay, right. Um, so this is where it's at at the moment. This is what it looks like at the moment behind here. Okay, now I'm going to erase my writing and we're going to care and change to a thing and we're going to carry on. Okay, so let's carry on. I'm trying to carry on. Okay, so let's carry on. Okay, let's play. So now we get... Okay, so now we get to where it's perpendicular. Okay, it's going to be perpendicular. So do you see the magnetic field lines are straight across, but the electric field around it is now at 90 degrees to it. So there's no interaction. And what you end up with is that the angle between the normal to the coil and direction of the magnetic field is 180 degrees, which effectively is zero. Okay, we're now looking at this point here. We're looking at this point here where there'll be no magnet, no voltage, okay? The magnetic flux is at a 100%. In other words, we're, we are moving, but the problem is that the position of the coil with respect to the magnetic field line is in the same plane. So therefore, it is not actually going to cause there to be any voltage. As we carry on now, you will see that what happens is it's going to carry on. And as I showed you before, you end up with a change in the direction of the electrons. Okay, exactly the same rule as what we used before, the right-hand wire rule. Okay, same reason. Okay, so it causes electrons to flow in the opposite direction and you will end up with a maximum. So yeah, we've got it going in the opposite direction and then we end up in a maximum value again and then we end up with a full rotation and go back again. So that's what's happening. Okay, so if we do it stepwise, Okay, this is just me clear all this crap. Okay, so if you go stepwise, you can see that we've got it playing. So it's going, now it's going to be going to zero again, and then it's in maximum and then zero. Okay, and then, right. So as you're going on, you can see that basically 
um, the more, the faster it turns, okay, the greater the voltage will be and everything else. But we're going to talk more about how to read the voltage and that after we put in the next couple of lessons. Okay, so that's it for today's lesson. Um, I hope you now understand, have a better grip of how generators work and how they produce electricity. Have a great day.